Hello, welcome to today's Research America Alliance member webinar. And thank you to everyone in the audience for joining us and for your ongoing partnership in our alliance. These are challenging times, important times, and times of opportunity. We really appreciate your participation. Today, we are very pleased to be joined by Paul Eppner, the CEO and co-founder of the Society to Improve Diagnosis in Medicine. We all um, are solidly behind you, Paul, and your colleagues in wanting that improvement. Paul's going to speak with us about the crucial importance of equipping physicians with the right information and tools to diagnose disease with accuracy and timeliness. And this does involve a role for research and for all of us who are advocates for research. Now, as usual, please type your questions into the Q&A box or the chat as we go along, and we'll gladly do our utmost to ask every single one when we get to the Q&A portion of today's meeting. Let me now turn it to you, Paul, with thanks for joining us. Thanks, Mary. Um, and thanks to your team for giving me this opportunity. This is a, um, research is such an important part of solving the problem of diagnostic error uh, that this is a, an amazing opportunity to be able to share some information and probably provide some a little bit of guidance as well. Um, I, I have about 15 minutes of slides and prepared remarks before we get to the Q&A. So uh, with that, I'll launch right in. And first, just maybe one quick slide on uh, the Society to Improve Diagnosis in Medicine. Many of you may not have heard of it, uh, but SIDM, as we call ourselves, has only been around for 10 years. We incorporated in 2011. We are a 501c3 charity. And our vision is to create a world where no patients are harmed by diagnostic error. Um, a key element of our mission is we're small, we're young, we had no employees until 2017. I was a volunteer uh, full-time employee for the first five years. Um, and, and, and so we know that we cannot solve this big problem by ourselves. And so our goal is to catalyze and lead change and everything we do is in, within partnerships. So we certainly look forward to having partnerships with some of the people on the phone today. And our value is patients engagement. You know, if you think about patients in our fragmented health society, patients are only the, the only common denominator in many of these diagnostic odysseys that cross settings and cross professions, etc. And so we've got to figure out a better way to engage with them. Um, we do care about overuse and, and but also underuse. So the universal access to appropriate diagnostic resources and equity is such an issue in diagnosis. Uh, it is certainly one of our core values. So when I talk about diagnostic error, what do I mean? So the Institute of Medicine, now the National Academy of Medicine, produced this report in 2015. And by the way, SIDM petitioned for this study. We wrote the scope of work for the study and we raised about 70% of the funding required to conduct the study. But this report, which is freely available to everyone and has recommendations and details in it, came up with this definition of a diagnostic error. It's a failure to establish an accurate, and timely explanation. So Mary, you had a perfect explanation of the patient's problem, but they also added a dimension that most people didn't add prior to this time period, and that's communicating that explanation to the patient. Improving diagnosis is really complicated, and it's complicated in research, it's complicated in practice. Just identifying cases, you know, I remember the Supreme Court discussion about pornography and people were asked to define pornography and the justice said, I can't define it, but I know it when I see it. And I think the same is true as diagnostic care, it's especially because of issues of timeliness. What's a delay? When does a delay become an error? When does a judgment call become a problem? 
And so just identifying the cases is difficult. And many of our software programs and tools for identifying errors and problems don't even list diagnostic error as a category, although that's slowly changing because of the work SIDM does. Analyzing the problem, understanding it is really complicated. Every diagnosis or nearly everyone involves uncertainty. And it represents an involving process with unique presentations in every patient. So you're dealing with very different kinds of analysis when problems happening. We just don't really have best practices um, uh, that really help with issues like timeliness. And when we do investigate diagnostic error, we tend to bifurcate it into, is it a cognitive issue? If so, we're gonna take it behind closed doors and peer review. If it's a system issue, we're gonna send it off to the root cause analysis people. But the trouble is, as I'll data, I'll show you in just a second, uh, almost every diagnostic error involves both. So by separating it out into peer review versus RCA, you're immediately learn, making it more difficult to really understand uh, what the situation is. Remember that in the, the tools, the retrospective reporting, et cetera, a lot of the work that you all do is looking at a disease process. In diagnosis, we don't deal with diseases, we deal with symptoms. The disease is the outcome that we're looking for, the label that will drive treatment decisions. But when you get to the treatment decision, you've stopped the diagnostic process. You may come back to it, but you've stopped it for the moment. And so that whole notion of dealing with symptoms that could be multiple diseases is unique, of course, to diagnosis. We don't have feedback mechanisms. We don't have report cards. EMR functionality is around diseases and reimbursement. It's not around symptoms. It's not around the differential. It's not around cognitive processes. So that really makes diagnosis challenging. Let me pick up the speed just a little bit here and just say, here's a little bit of the epidemiology. Uh, Hardeep, and I can get you references for all of this, but Hardeep Singh published with others that in outpatient settings, 12 million adults a year experience a delayed or inaccurate diagnosis. When the NORC has done a study of medical errors among patients who've experienced medical errors, 60% of them report diagnostic error as what they experience. Uh, Gunderson came up with a study that looked just at premature deaths in hospitals and estimated based on the research, 100,000 die prematurely every year because of diagnostic failures. And we say prematurely because a, a timely diagnosis of cancer may not change change the outcome, but, it, but the timeliness may affect whether it's a premature death, and that's why we throw in that word. And then David Newman-Toker has come up with uh, cost estimates to the economy in excess of 100 billion per year. So it's burdensome. We funded some research using CRICO data and led by David Newman-Toker at Hopkins to look at serious misdiagnosis claims among the malpractice claims. So serious is using the National Association of Insurance Commissioners severity scale of six to nine, it's death and permanent disability. And what they found is that diagnostic error among all malpractice claims that are serious, diagnostic errors are the most common, the most catastrophic, and the most costly of all diagnostic, which is even if you remove the filter of serious harms and look at many of the malpractice carriers and their own research, it's really very similar results across all claims, diagnostic error tends to be number one. So this is a big problem. David and team did further analysis in their big three study. And the reason it's called big three is what he found was that 74% of all of the serious harms were in three categories, infection, cancer, and vascular events. So that was 74% were all in those three categories. When you look further at the contributing factors or root causes, he found about three and a half contributing factors per claim. So there is no one single 
silver bullet that's going to solve this issue. But across all the claims, 85% of them involved a, clinical, a clinician judgment issue, whether it be what test to order, what was on the differential, did they not even include the target disease in their considerations? Did they fail to appreciate certain signs or symptoms? Did they misinterpret what the implications of a result were? So these are all the kinds of things that really drive a lot of poor outcomes, diagnostic outcomes, but also clinic uh, communications and system failures um, were certainly big categories. And as I said, it totals to more than 100% because there are three and a half uh, contributing factors per claim. You would think with something that's this burdensome, that's this prevalent, that this this harmful, that there'd be a lot of research into improving it. Uh, a rather old study, about five years old, but when we look at this percent of federal funding that goes towards diagnostic error, it really is a drop in the bucket. In fact, it's less than what is funded for an obsolete disease like smallpox. There's more funding for smallpox than this hugely catastrophic cause of poor, of morbidity and mortality. Um, certainly, if you look at all medical research back in 2016, it was 35 billion. If you look at things that include biomarkers and other things that mention diagnosis, you can get up to 7 billion. If you really look at what are the contributing factors and going after that, it was $7 million. We've been successful in Congress in making this number bigger, but it is still not much bigger. It's probably in the 10 to $12 million a year now. It's still a drop in the bucket. And additionally, there are certain significant structural impediments to solving this funding problem. Look at how NIH is organized. They're organized around organs or diseases. They're not, or, there is no institute for chest pain. There is no institute for dizziness. There is no institute for undifferentiated abdominal pain. And so the way we are set up in our funding mechanisms whether it be NIH or any other um, organization that provides funding tends to be around a paradigms that do not include diagnosis. And really this early translational work and then the comparative effectiveness and translating to practice, very little of that is getting done. Um, and that's what we're trying to certainly um, address with some of our work in DC. Um, I can tell you that uh, NQF has heard the message and they've is, had now a couple task forces. This was the first one to identify measures of diagnostic error, but it is, uh, it, they came up and said, there's nothing ready for prime time yet. So we're, there's a lot of work going on. The Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, who we recruited to the cause, and you may know, that Harvey Feinberg was the, is the CEO of the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation. He was the president of the IOM and our report was the last report that he signed off on before he left the Institute of Medicine to go to the Gordon and Betty Moore. So he certainly um, has found this to be an issue, but their board has committed $86 million over six years to addressing this problem with about half of that being addressed to the issue of measures approximately. They're trying to catalyze and jumpstart this issue of measures. Now, there are some early kinds of work about measures that, that are promising. Uh, David, again at Hopkins, came up with this, what they call SPADE analysis, the symptom disease pair analysis. And let me just illustrate this uh, as, as one good example. They looked at the number of patients coming into emergency rooms using just administrative data who presented with vertigo and were discharged with a benign vertigo um, discharge uh, diagnosis and then reappeared in the um, emergency room with a stroke diagnosis. And you can see that, and they used uh, MI as a sort of control. And MI among this population stayed relatively flat. And um, the patient population of those presenting with benign vertigo stayed relatively flat. But in those first two weeks, 
there was this huge spike of people released with a benign vertigo um, discharge diagnosis who reappeared within one or two weeks with a major stroke. And that's the indicator that something's going on diagnostically. Not all of it may be preventable. Uh, not all of it is an error, but it is certainly a target rich environment that we can use to try to think about improvement. SIDM itself is trying to do things. We, we have a seed grant program where we're awarding $50,000 quality improvement seed grants. Um, our target is to, to award 20 per year. Uh, we will be opening up our portal in the uh, next uh, couple months for the next uh, um, cohort. Um, and uh, we're very excited uh, about this. We have, uh, um, we only, by the way, awarded 16 this last year because the grant review committee, which is in independent, didn't find 20 that they felt were worth, um, uh, worth funding. Um, so there's really room to do more there. We have a fellowship program um, that you can find out more on our website that has just been renewed for another three years. Um, and, and so we have eight fellows currently that uh, we they have curriculum, we create a community, et cetera. Um, we're very active in Congress. Uh, fiscal year 18, we got report language in. Fiscal year 19, we had a line item added to in the uh, spending, the appropriations bill for $2 million of new money going to ARC, plus the creation of an interagency work group. Uh, fiscal year 20, that was bumped up to 3 million, but 1 million of that was just moving from one pocket to the other. And the House did introduce this HR 5014, which is a five-year authorization bill. It is still languishing in the House. It's not moving anywhere. Fiscal year 21, a lot of last minute things happened. It fell back to 2 million in the line item. Meanwhile, ARC increased its funding from its own internal sources and identified diagnostic error as one of its three strategic priorities. They're doing a lot. Fiscal year 22, the House in their appropriations bill um, in the new budget that still has not been, of course, even gone to the Senate yet, they now have 8 million as a line item for diagnostic error. And we are about to see an, an author, a five-year authorization bill introduced in the Senate that will create uh, and a program in ARC similar to the HAI, Hospital Acquired Infections, that we're hoping will authorize 30 to 35 million a year. That still needs to be appropriated, of course, annually. We have an amazing conference coming up. If you want to learn more, that'll be virtual. It's at the end of the month. You can see more at our website. But we're really focusing on the issue of disparities, and we have amazing uh, plenary speakers, Peter Pronovost, Tej Al Gandhi, David Ansel, Chris Castle, Maya Dusenberry, Ibrahim Said, or Mimal Sarkar. Yeah, I, I can go on. Um, you can read more about it at our website. Let me just close with um, some quotes that came out of the uh, National Academy's report. The delivery of healthcare has proceeded for decades with a blind spot, diagnostic errors. Most of us can relate to it. Most of us either have experienced or know someone um, who has experienced that gone on a diagnostic journey. Um, and improving the diagnostic process is not only possible, but it also represents a moral, professional, and public health imperative. And I will leave you with this in thinking about it at sort of an intuitive level. If the diagnosis is wrong, everything downstream is suspect, could be harmful. Meanwhile, the underlying disease is worsening. So this is a foundational work that needs to be done and we need more people involved. Let me stop and see if there are any questions or discussion. Thank you. Well, Paul, thank you so much. Uh, we've uh, all learned a lot from you and totally agree that uh, the imperative is uh, overwhelming. I mean, how can there be any doubt? Um, I uh, have one question to ask, and I know we have some coming in also from our audience. Um, so is, tell me to what extent you think that data is a problem? Um, do we have enough 
data to work on and just not enough bodies to work with it. When I think of all the possibilities of gathering data these days, including from wearable devices and all the rest, where does that fit in, that problem? Data is a huge problem. We're starting to think about wearables, and you know there's lots of discussion mm -hmm. about what to integrate, how to integrate that into the medical records. Um, there are no structured fields for symptoms. There is a reason for encounter field that often is not retained in the data warehouses. Um, there is no place to document the differential. So it's hard with all the handoffs we have to retrace the thinking. It, anchoring bias is very easy because there's a working diagnosis that suddenly becomes the, the diagnosis and everyone works to that people come into the emergency room uh, with some kind of a mental health uh, comorbidity, and all of a sudden every symptom is a mental health thing. So our data is horrible. Our data warehouses are lacking. And if you think of our registries, our registries tend to be um, sorted around diseases or procedures and filter out what might be the diagnostic errors, both the false yeah. positives and which will filter out when they become known as false positives or the false negatives because they never make it in. So we have a yeah. very incomplete data look, a data yeah. picture. Well, when you add that realization to the other missed opportunities in the field, it seems to me that you need more than double what's now happening. Oh, um, we need so much more. Oh my gosh, yes. Um, so I, uh, I know we've got another question or, or two. Um, I know I have more. Um, Anna, can you join us uh, with some questions from the audience? Absolutely, happy to. And just as a reminder to folks, please feel free to put your questions into the Q&A box or the chat and we will do our best to ask them. So Paul, one um, question that has come in is you mentioned that some research doesn't address nonspecific symptoms that require diagnosis, um, but doesn't diagnostic research focus on specific diseases? So as to be able to distinguish them from these, those nonspecific symptoms. So um, yes and no, because research isn't monolithic. Uh, I was part of a research team that focused on looking to see, could we crowdsource diagnoses by looking in the medical record if we just looked at patients presenting in primary care with an undifferentiated complaint of abdominal pain. And so that's research, and that was around undifferentiated symptoms. Those tend, you know, when, when a patient comes into the emergency room with half their body paralyzed, the, it, the diagnosis is relatively straightforward. It's those undifferentiated symptoms. It's the women coming in with arm pain who are having NMI. It's that benign vertigo, which 90% of the time is not gonna be a stroke. It, so it, it is the undifferentiated systems. And what are the diagnostic pitfalls? What are the barriers we have to them? What are the cognitive processes? What kind of clinical decision support do we need on the differential to make sure that we only don't only focus on the most likely, but also the can't miss diagnoses? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank, thank you for that. So another uh, question that has come in, do you think physicians and healthcare providers receive the proper training needed to address issues in diagnostics? What may be missing or uh, needs to be added there? So I'll answer that two ways. First thing, in medical school, nothing was taught about, in general, nothing is taught about bias or clinical reasoning as a skill per se. We teach scripts, disease scripts. We, ban it, we memorize you know, a great many presentations and try to recall those things. We've actually, with thanks to a grant from the Macy Foundation, developed an interprofessional uh, um, framework for curriculum around clinical reasoning uh, that's available at our website and are trying to address some of those issues in various medical schools. Mm -hmm. The other issue I'll mention briefly as just one more example, not the totality of the answer, is laboratory medicine. I spent 31 years in, at Abbott Laboratories in laboratory medicine, wrote a, um, an op-ed in, in the Hill on some of our COVID testing. There's a lot of poor understanding among clinicians 
around di uh, brown laboratory tests, around sensitivity, specificity, likelihood ratios, the seroprevalence in an area, how to interpret a result. Um, most physicians, and, and I, I was part of a CDC research effort that actually quantified this, they tend to either believe that as objective data that they look at a number and make a decision, or they tend to discount the result altogether when it doesn't match what their intuition is. And so we have a lot to do in terms of, we can't have physicians learn more. They already know more than anyone in the world, I think. So, so the challenge is what kind of aid, how do we use teams? How do we use clinical decision support? to amplify their skills and their knowledge to make better decisions. So Paul, that um, triggers for me a, a different kind of question, which I, because I completely agree with you that we can't expect physicians to know all things. You know, there's different sources of information to rely on, but part of that is in communicating with the patient, right? And you pointed out that this is one of the big problems in your presentation, you pointed out the big problem of communicating a diagnosis effectively. So what can uh, patients do to do a better job of eliciting a, an accurate diagnosis, describing their own symptoms um, in a more effective way, perhaps? But do you have any advice for all sure. of us when it's our turn to be a patient? Yeah, and, and I don't know if you have any funders on, on the call, but we actually have a proposal we're promoting now about, you know, as a result of the Cures Act, um, mm -hmm. clinical notes are now available to patients, uh, but the read rate is really low. And Sigal Bell at uh, Beth Deaconess, who's part of the Open Notes uh, platform, it's not a platform, but philosophy, um, they've mm -hmm. shown that patients recognize misinformation or missing information when they read their clinical notes and can mm -hmm. be a self-correcting force. And how we leverage that, how do we get, and that's what we want to do. We want to mm -hmm. create a national campaign that will train patients and motivate them not after they have a disease label, but while they're going through the diagnostic journey to be paying special attention. That certainly is one way. Asking the question, what else can it be? Uh, is a trigger uh, to, on, uh -huh. for clinical uh -huh. judgment and to a pr think about that differential or what's the worst that it could be. Not what, don't tell me how I shouldn't worry. Tell me what's the worst thing we don't, what's the thing we don't want it to be, but could be. Um, those kinds of questions can certainly help. And we have started training patients on how to participate in research design, uh, execution, and dissemination. We have something we call our paired curriculum that PCORI funded just to make sure patients are not just a sad story or, or a token at the research table, but a participant in it. Boy, that does sound like PCORI's um, territory thoroughly. Yes. That's great yes. to hear. So I think we probably have time for maybe one or two more questions at the most. Anna, you have one. Sure. Yes, absolutely. It's another question that's come in, Paul. How can the, the patient and clinician advocacy communities be part of mitigating this issue? What, what can they do? So um, when we knew the IOM, now National Academy report, was going to be published in 2015, um, we said, how do we make sure this does, just doesn't sit on a shelf? And so we created a coalition at that point with only 13 organizations. Now it's up to 70. It includes American College of Emergency Physicians. It includes the Society of Hospital Medicine, but it also includes LeapFrog and Joint Commission and CMS and Intermountain Healthcare and Geisinger and Cleveland Clinic. And it includes Sepsis Alliance and American Heart Association Association and uh, the um, um, Colon Cancer Alliance. And so we're trying to make sure that we get all these groups at our coalition table working together. And um, there's more information on our website. These organizations should join and work with us in a concentrated way, both in Congress and in the actual work we do as an organization in the field. So, so, Paul, um, the way you work as an alliance is really striking and, you know, welcome news because, of course, that's how we work as well, Research America. And we're, we're proud to be working with you 
I'm totally on board with your mission and I uh, value the way that you talked about it, you know, your mission, your values, your, your commitment, and it shows in the remarks you just gave us. So there's um, a way, I don't remember now, but do we have, or could we put in the chat how to get in touch with Paul for people who uh, may have further question or want more information about the society and how they can help you? Um, we'll certainly be keeping our eyes and ears out for you, Paul. So thank you. Uh, we wish you total success in your work all the, all the time. It's for all of our benefit. That's, that's for sure. Well, thank um, you. And then we appreciate your partnership and the opportunity to be here today and share this, this information. Well, and we, we wish you well. So folks, don't, um, don't leave just yet uh, because we do have a couple of quick announcements. Um, so uh, please take a look before you go. Um, next week on uh, the 6th, that's Wednesday next week, we'll be speaking with author Lee McIntyre, who is a research fellow um, at the Center for Philosophy and the History of Science at Boston University. He's going to talk to us about science communication and how to engage with science skeptics through, uh, quote, technique rebuttal, unquote. I hope you'll be with us. And also, don't forget that applications are open for Research America's Civic Engagement Microgrant Program. Please share this information far and wide uh, to the early career researchers you may know who are interested in support for projects they have in mind on science communication, on policy, and building partnerships with the public officials and the community. And you can see the deadline is October 12th. With that, I wish you um, a good day, the rest of today, the last day of the federal fiscal year. It also happens to be a Thursday, so look for my weekly letter in your inbox before long. Thank you, and thanks for your membership in Research America.